again. Thank you for your help with that. I know that's helpful to our parents who are getting their little ones uh, situated elsewhere and as they make their way back in. So let me say, as others have, Happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Sunday. We thank God for the gift of His Son and for His resurrection, which is what gives us confidence that there is real life with Him after these bodies get old and wear out and decay. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is good news. Amen? Now, if you want to hear more details about the resurrection of Jesus, there are four places you should mark and turn and read later. We're not going to read all those together today. But they're, in essence, the last chapter of each of the four Gospels. So again, if you want the details, you should go later and read Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke chapter 24, and the Gospel of John chapters 20 and 21. They're great reading. We're going to spend most of our time this morning continuing the series we've been in now for some time, well, since the beginning of January, in the Gospel of Mark. So we're going to find ourselves in Mark chapter 8. If you want to go ahead and be opening in your Bible to that passage, we'll read uh, a fair amount from there this morning. And as you're turning there, I want to remind you of one of Jesus' resurrection appearances, one that is recorded in John chapter 20, starting in verse 24. And I want to read this one to you. I'm not going to have this one on the screen. The rest of the passages I will this morning. Because this one I added late in the game, so to speak, but it, it speaks, I think, to kind of what you and I are going to try to process. Or we're going to try to sort of clarify it together as we work through the lesson this morning. Again, this is from John chapter 20, verses, uh, starting verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. See, what that's telling us about is Jesus has risen from the dead. He appeared to Mary and the other women at the empty tomb. And they ran and told the twelve, the disciples, the eleven at this point, because Judas has killed himself. They, he, they ran and told them that they went to the tomb and it was empty. And, this, and the angel said, he is not dead, he is risen, as he said. And the disciples were unbelieving until Jesus, later that day, appeared with them and showed himself to them and said, look, look at my hands, look at my side. And they believed. But Thomas called the twin wasn't with them. And so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands and the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails, unless I place my hand into his side, I will never believe it. And eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. And although the door was locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. And put out your hand. Place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Amen? How good are your eyes? We've all been to the eye doctor before. They've had us look something like this. And then the doctor starts having you look through different lenses until you find one that clarifies things. I mean, who doesn't want clarity in life? We all want it. We all want to be able to focus. We all want to have a sense of assurance of where we're going and how we're going to get there and the things we want to achieve in life. But when we live without some sort of clarity and identity and purpose, 
then life becomes a strain and a struggle. It becomes anxious. It becomes too stressful. But Jesus is able to help us with that. We've already heard three scriptures read by three different men this morning, all from the Gospel of Mark. And in each passage, we heard Jesus tell his followers that he was going to die and then be raised. What a crazy thing to say. What an unfathomable thing for those disciples to hear. And yet Jesus knew where he was going. Jesus was able to focus, even if his disciples couldn't yet. But little by little, they were slowly beginning to see who he was. They didn't fully understand it. I suspect that what he told them when he said, I'm going to go and die and then be raised, I, I suspect that confused them. Maybe it even scared them. But he knew they had to hear it, as do we. And so we pick up his story this morning in Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 22. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And the blind man looked up and he said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And Jesus sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. This is an odd story, is it not? If you've been here in previous weeks, we've read lots of miracle stories of Jesus. Lots of them. And he always seems to get it right on the first try. Amen? So people are sometimes confused by this. And they say, well, this is a head scratcher. I mean, what's going on? Was Jesus low on power? Did the blind man not have sufficient faith? Well, that's silliness. Our Jesus is never low on power. Amen? Our Jesus never gets it wrong. Amen? He knows what He's doing. He's able to do it. And if He chooses it, it happens. Amen? We have evidence of that. And it's not the fact that this man's faith wasn't enough. That's not the issue here. But what's going on here is that Jesus is teaching something through these actions. It becomes a demonstrated parable where he enacts a thing that he wants not only the, his disciples to understand as he goes step by step, as he takes this man gradually from where he is, where he can't see a thing, to where the eye doctor turns that lens and it's like, yeah, that's better, but it's not clear yet. You've been there, right? You know what that's like? And finally, when they flip it and it all comes into focus, it's like, there it is. That's what Jesus is doing whenever he helps this man grow in clarity little by little. Jesus already understood that it was going to take time for people to really understand who he is and what he was doing. Not only the Pharisees and the self-righteous who already disputed him and were skeptical of him and his claims, but even Jesus' family from earlier in the gospel. Do you remember that? He was out doing great things, doing mighty things, and there were times they said, hey, 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 whoa, whoa. Let's get him. Get him in the house. Even they didn't understand. In spite of all the things Jesus has shown his disciples, when he says, I'm going to have to go and die and then be raised, they don't understand. But this is a process that Jesus is using to help people understand who he was and to know why he kept teaching people about the good news of the kingdom of God, to comprehend how their old expectations about the Messiah, the Christ, 
had to grow into something bigger. Their notion of what God was doing had to be stretched out bigger so that they could finally comprehend what it was that He was doing. And Jesus went on with His disciples to the village, to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, He asked His disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told Him, John the Baptist. And others say, Elijah. And others say, one of the prophets. And Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And Jesus strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Even the people who saw him every day were still coming to a clear idea of who he was. And as Jesus went from place to place, knowing the timing of God, knowing that he had to, he had to lay things out in a gradual way or people would never understand, he's willing to take great risk to help people come to faith as they're able just as He does you and me. Thankful to God that He gives us more than one Sunday in church to believe in Him. Amen? Aren't you thankful to God that He gives us time to hear His Word and to think through it and to process it? And to even if it means we come to faith gradually over years and years as some people do, aren't you glad that God gives us the time? Amen? And Jesus is giving them time to see. Because so many people, when they look at Him for the first time, when they catch that first glimpse, they just don't know what they're looking at. I want to show you a picture. Many of you have seen this before. But I want to show you this picture, and I want you to look at it as quickly as you can, and think as quickly as you can, what is it that you see? What's the first thing that you see? Well, not that one. There we go. How many of you see a pretty young woman looking back towards the left in the distance, the bonnet on her head? How many of you see a large profile of an old woman with a grinning face? Hmm, interesting. How many of you now see both? How many of you are just completely confused? Megan, I've got all kinds of clients here for you. Megan works at the eye doctor's office. <laughs> Things might initially look different to different people. But if this was a photograph of a real person, she could only be one or the other. Do you agree? She could only be the young woman looking in the back. Or the old lady with a big wart on her nose. She could only be one or the other. Despite initial appearances, we find something similar when we look at Jesus. When you think about Jesus and who He is, who do you see? A good man? A wise teacher? Powerful healer, a fire-breathing prophet, John the Baptist, a threat to your supposed self-sufficiency. These are some of the views that Jesus' contemporaries had of Him. And so when He asks His disciples, but who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Christ then Jesus must know they're getting warmer. They're not all the way there yet. They don't see everything He needs them to see. But Jesus has been leading them to it little by little. It's similar to the way we do with children. 
who are hunting Easter eggs. Later today, by the way, if you have little kids after Bible class, we're going to invite them to come into the foyer. There'll be grown-ups helping, line them up by age, and some of our youth group and others are going to hide, like, I don't know, 1.3 million eggs, I think, in the auditorium and let your little ones hunt. Okay, we got baskets and eggs full of candy and all that stuff. So you'll hear more about that after Bible class. But if you've ever had little kids and you took them out on an egg hunt, you probably played a little game like my wife and I have done with ours. So whenever our kids were little, so like a year ago, we would hide Easter eggs filled with candy out in the yard at home. And we live on an acre, and so there's plenty of places to hide. Some of the hiding places are a little too good. You know, and so the, 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 a mean parent, like Charity, you know, would hide them where it's hard. I don't know why you're laughing at that, where it's hard for the kids to find them. And eventually, it's too hard, and we, we lose patience. And it's like, all right, here, here's a hint. Uh, look up near the flower bed. And so the kids might go up, and they start looking around. And if they still need help, you play the game you played, when the, like hide-and-seek kind of game, right? Warmer, warmer. Colder, warmer, hot, hot. You ever play that game? So Jesus isn't going around saying warmer, but that's what he's doing. He's giving them glimpses. And whenever they get off track, he's redirecting them. Because there's still much that they just don't understand. Yet he's trying to move them closer to a full understanding of not only who he is, but what he has to do in order to live out his mission as the Messiah, the anointed of God who is sent to be the Savior of the world. Mark 8, verse 31. And Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. Now he said this plainly. And Peter, Peter, the one who just said, you are the Christ. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now how silly is this? How silly is it for a human being, for you and you or for me, to take Jesus aside and say, hold on now, you don't know what you're talking about. How silly is that? How foolish is it for us to take Jesus aside and say, no, 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 no. Suffering? Nuh-uh. Hardship? Nope. What do you mean my cross? Nope, nope, nope. We're willing to say, yeah, Peter is a bit of a fool. And then we start to contextualize it and think, have we ever said something to God like, no, no, no. And Jesus turned and saw his disciples, and he rebuked Peter. And he said, get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of men. And this, I think, church, is where we all get stuck. Focusing on the things of man. Focusing on the ways of the world getting caught up in the things we think are worthy, the things we think we ought to pursue, the things we think will make us happy, instead of looking intently at the things of God. And so we get caught up in pride, and we get caught up in power, and we get caught up in the constant pursuit of pleasure, getting too wrapped up in ourselves to notice that God is trying to work a thing in our life, that God is trying to deliver us, that we are shackled and don't know it, that we wear chains that we can't see, but we can feel them if we stop and think about it, to be aware that we have been enslaved because of our own sin to the father of lies, to the great deceiver, to the one who was a murderer from the beginning, the great rebel, Satan. And instead, God is trying to liberate us from Him and His power, from the very power of death. And too often we say, no, 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 we know our way. 
And Jesus says, you're thinking about the wrong things. Look at the things of God. Jesus never said this was going to be easy. Do you notice that? Find me that verse where Jesus says, come after me, follow me, and everything you ever wanted will be yours. Jesus doesn't say that, but the devil does. Jesus doesn't say, all you got to do is come and bow down and I'll take away all the pain. All you got to do is come and worship me. And all the trials and tribulations and stresses of the world you can avoid. He doesn't say that. But the devil did. He said it to Jesus in the wilderness. Now Jesus says, I've come that they might have life, but the way he brings it is through his death. Verse 34. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anybody would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. What a paradox, huh? For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Amen. Man, we have read a lot. We have read some tough things. The disciples who were there with him are, are being engorged with all of this information that they don't yet know how to process. When they try to think their way through it, they just can't quite get it. And who can blame them? We wouldn't either. When Jesus says, if you want to follow me, take up your cross, they must be thinking, what? I got a down payment on a nice sword. You see, because they expected Jesus, the Messiah, they finally identified Him. You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of our people. When they understood Him to be that, they thought, the Messiah was coming to, on a stallion with a sword and an army. And that by the great power of God that they had witnessed through Jesus, that finally they had an advantage. They had a super weapon who could overcome the Romans. And so this Messiah was going to come and he was going to build his army. And they'd had plenty of Messiahs in the past. Every one of them was dead. Some of them crucified. Because the Romans didn't do much losing in these days. And they thought, here he is. Now he's coming. Now he's speaking clearly. Now he's going to call this army. And by the great power he has, he's going to deliver and set up the kingdom. And of David's reign, there will be no end. It's Messiah through the line of David. It's prophesied in the Old Testament. And Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem. To die. And Peter says, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't be saying stuff like that. That's no way to recruit. And then Jesus says, if you want to be my follower, you're going to have to carry your cross with me. And the disciples must be going, oh. It was bad enough when he said he was going to die. Now he's saying, we're going to die too? That that's the, that's the process to some kind of victory? And we might hear that and think, this is crazy talk. This is like Jim Jones and Jamestown talk. This is drink the Kool-Aid talk. Who wants that? We've seen plenty of people come through the years who claim to know, well, it's this comet, or it's this date, or it's this earthquake, or it's this war, 
And so get ready, it's coming. And then, then they all kill themselves out of some ridiculous sense of devotion to some so-called divine prophecy that they think leads them to God. And they're all dead. And Jesus says something that must have sounded as, as similarly nuts to His disciples. I'm going to go and die, but I'm going to raise again. He told them at least the three times we read about in Mark. And even after the third time, they still don't get it. Why? Because they, they don't have a concept of that. Because they don't believe Him. And there will be far too many people who were raised from the dead on that great day who never believed Him. Jesus, in spite of the limitations of His disciples, He knew who He was. And He could clearly see the difference between the things of God and the things of man. Jesus opens our spiritual eyes just as He opened the eyes of the man who had been blind at Bethsaida. We get clarity when we learn to see Jesus through the lens of Jesus and through His resurrection. His death makes sense of our life. Amen? We love because He loved. We serve one another because He served. We sacrifice ourselves and we take risks for those in need around us. Because Jesus did that kind of thing all the time. If you learn to look at life through Him, it will change how you see the world and your purpose in it. So how do we do that? How do we learn to focus and gain clarity? Well, first, we look more closely. And we listen more intently. And we immerse ourselves in what God has said, what God has done, and what God continues to do. You cannot see if you don't open your eyes and you cannot see Him if you aren't looking in His direction. Is it easy? No. Does it cost nothing? No. Do we see it all at once? Perfect clarity? No. But is there any other place where we can look for hope, for forgiveness, for purpose, for meaning, for insight? And for abundant life that lasts both now and in the resurrection life to come, is there any other place to go but to the Lord? There is not. It involves some pain, self-denial, sacrifice. It might involve being misunderstood, mislabeled by people you know. But Jesus says that it's worth it. And His own promised resurrection proved it. So that when we come to see Him for who He is, the only worthy response on our lips can be the one we heard from Thomas this morning. My Lord and my God. Amen? This is what we proclaim and celebrate every Sunday when we come together to worship God. This is what we proclaim, not just on Easter, but on every Lord's Day when we take the Lord's Supper, communion, what some know as the Eucharist, when we partake of it and when we reaffirm our dedication to the covenant that Jesus ratified through His death and through His resurrection. If you this morning are willing to rededicate yourself to God, 
and to proclaim again that you believe that Jesus Christ is the risen Son of God, then take out your communion bread with me this morning. And we will take this opportunity to give God thanks and to confirm what we vowed in our baptism, which is that we are sinners who've been saved by the grace of God, who by vow and covenant join in the work of Jesus to become Jesus in the flesh, through this body that we call the church, to serve those around us as He did, to bring hope and life, not simple judgment, but hope and life and mercy, as He did, because that's the mission He gave His people. And His resurrection from the dead proved His power, proved His identity, and proved that it's worth it. Let's pray for the bread that represents His body. Our dear God in heaven, all glory and honor be to You and to Your name. You alone are mighty and worthy and powerful. You alone are true and just and merciful. And so we come before You asking for Your forgiveness for our sins, asking You to help us see more clearly, asking that You would give us wisdom as we ask in faith with no doubt that you indeed will give it to those who ask or to those who seek you. Lord, we've come today praising Jesus, your Son. We celebrate His resurrection again today, knowing that He went to that cross and laid lifeless in that tomb for us, but that it was worth it. That out of your love for us, you deemed it worth it. And so God, when we partake of this bread this morning, we recommit ourselves here and now to be people who walk by faith, to be a people who renounce sin, to be a people who pursue You with passion, because we know that You alone are Lord and King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we partake of the fruit of the vine that reminds us of the blood He shed, I want to read to you a well-known passage from that old priest in Jerusalem, that old prophet named Isaiah. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Yet he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, and upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. But God did not abandon his body to decay. Amen? Praise God for that. That He who took our stripes is the one who was nowhere to be found Sunday morning when His mother and others went to the tomb to anoint His body. And He is the one who said, I'm risen. Go and tell the disciples that I'm risen. When we partake of this fruit of the vine, there's so much to think about. His suffering, His death, 
that last supper when he shared the fruit of the vine with those same disciples the night he would be arrested, when he said, this is the new covenant poured out in my blood, I established this with you, for you. Did they understand? No. Did they see it clearly? No. But in the days to come, would God open their eyes all the way so that they could see who he was and what he's done and, and the purpose he gave for their lives? Yes. Would they go on to carry their own crosses for his sake? Yes. Would they go on and lose their lives for the sake of the sharing of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of a resurrected Messiah, the good news of a kingdom come, the good news of a place in it for every man and woman of every background, everyone who God created in his image, who would come and admit and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Is that why they died? Yes. And is that why he tells us to live in his name? Yes. There's no other reason. The church is not a club. We're not a, foro a, a sorority, a sorority, a fraternity. We're not a made up word either. <laughs> We're the body of Christ. Come together to worship him, yes, but to go out and serve others in his name. When we take this, this isn't a magic potion that forgives your sins for the weak. God forgives your sins by His grace. This is, not, this is not a token remembrance. This is us reaffirming the covenant that was ratified by the death of Jesus, that we bought into and committed to in our baptism. This is me saying, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. This is me saying, I believe He is risen. He's alive. He's here with us in spirit in the room today. And when we're in the presence of Him, how can we say any other thing but my Lord and my God? Pray with me. Dear God, we do indeed again in spirit bow down before You. Again, thanking You for the blood of Jesus that He willingly poured out, enduring the agony, the shame, and the pain of it all so that He could forgive our sins once and for all for everyone who would come to you in faith. Dear Lord, we pray that you give us strength and endurance so that we could continue to follow Jesus every day of our life until we take our last breath, that we can be instruments of your peace that share the good news and the glory of the coming kingdom with everyone we know, everyone we love, because why wouldn't we, God? Why wouldn't we want them to know the joy of life with you that we have? With all its trouble, with all its sacrifice. But Lord, what in the world would we give in exchange for our soul? If Satan gave us the whole world, it would be a terrible exchange when you promise us life, both now and in the resurrection to come. So Lord, we recommit ourselves in your presence in front of all these witnesses today to turn away from sin and to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Phil is going to come and lead us in a song, one final song. After the song, we'll have one final short scripture and a prayer. And we want you to know that if there's more questions you have about who this Jesus is, that it's okay to have questions. That God is patient. But don't abuse that patience. If you have questions, seek answers. Come and ask to study. I'm willing to study with you. Come and ask your questions. Come and ask your help. Because that's what all of us are trying to do, is follow more closely in the footsteps of Jesus in ways that allow us to have the life God intended us to have at the beginning. And never ever forget that we don't serve a God who decayed in the tomb. But we, just, we serve a God who rose up from the dead to give us life. If we can help you at all, we invite you to come as we stand together and sing. Love.